you have to make sure that everyone understands what you're doing, and you have to convince them that it is a good idea. Uh, and keep doing that until it's done, basically. So uh, what is a DME engine in our case? Uh, we had our first functional integration after three months. Uh, and even after the project, uh, we're still working on it to make it better. Uh, so Houdini Engine is basically the replication of the Houdini interface in our Anvil Next Engine. So we can use the same controls that you can use uh, in Houdini parameter, uh, in the Houdini parameter window, directly into the engine. Um, so during the project, we went from Houdini 12.5 all the way to 14.04. Uh, this was not at the most opportune time when we did this. Uh, some people were on holiday. Uh, it was in the, right next to one of our deadlines. But we pulled through, so we're quite happy to be here. Um, and right now there's a lot of things we can actually uh, manipulate uh, with 2 d Almost everything, and if there's something we cannot do yet, we can actually just ask. We have specialized engineers first to uh, build our integration. So uh, for the pipeline itself, uh, Houdini engine and Houdini itself is not enough just yet. Uh, we also need some tools to actually communicate between the engine and our render bar, our submission process. So we have a wall patch, which is uh, our way of using HQ, which is the default uh, Houdini uh, Render Farm Manager to actually select some areas in the world and recompute them with new data. Or instead, uh, you can schedule tasks and have them done automatically every day or every week. And finally, you can also do automated tasks. So if someone submits a new piece of terrain, uh, the Render Farm will catch that and will automatically deploy some uh, post-processing on it. And we also have uh, our Perforce integration, so version in control, directly in Houdini. And we have Python.net, which is a, a C-sharp Python uh, library that allows us to actually use Python and communicate with C-sharp applications uh, like our engine. So here's a diagram of some of the stuff that our <coughs> engine Python does. So as you can see, we have a lot of data that goes into the system and a lot of data that goes out of the system. I won't go into this very deeply, but uh, there's a lot of stuff going on. So uh, when actually dealing with tools, uh, like I said, uh, we want to avoid all encapsulating tasks, uh, tools, because at first they will seem very appealing because they give you all the control that you need, but after like a month or two, you will realize that it will become very hard to maintain. And when people ask for new features, there is a larger tool that you have to check completely if you didn't introduce any new bugs. And when you do, you have to fix them again and do the same process again. So uh, yeah, we now try to stay away from these uh, to actually keep our tools manageable. So instead of creating larger tools, we want to uh, have uh, the ability for tools to communicate between each other, which is something I'll discuss in a few slides ahead. And another thing is really that is really important is to keep track of dependencies. So if you have data that affects data that is the input of the tool, you get a recursive loop. And that way the output will change every time you recoup, and you want to really avoid that as well. Um, Collaborative work, so instead of larger tools, again, create sub-tools, but also small functionalities that you want to re reuse, uh, make them also separate tools. Because that way you can also uh, divide the tasks between more technically inclined people and more design-oriented people. So these skills actually do work quite well together. And one thing I might have also mentioned uh, last time, is that we're using a subtractive workflow. So instead of keeping, keep adding new parts to the world, we first want to have something for everything and then remove certain parts and fill them back in with 
more detail. Uh, because this gives a uh, couple of advantages, such as uh, creating a nice canvas for dub designers to work in, because they have a better pre preview of what the end result is going to look like. They can actually enhance the terrain and the environment in a way that feels more natural. They don't have like a blank piece of paper to work from, but they actually have an idea of what it's going to look like. Uh, and uh, as a bonus, there's a little bit less dependency between uh, tools if you use a subtractive workflow compared to an additive one. Okay, so yeah, you want to avoid the red line. Um, that's basically what we would think would happen if you create like only really large tools. Uh, basically, suddenly something needs to change, and then you're uh, what you are doing now. So uh, yeah, you want to make sure that everything is manageable, and if you want to change something, you can do that quickly without actually endangering your other tools. Uh, so, yeah, you want to probably between, between the green and the yellow line somewhere, because that's where realism lies. <laughs> okay, so uh, what worked for us was to have one person to build the encapsulating tool to, that contains all the subtools that work together. Uh, this way you can actually have one person that is testing the tool in different cases and gives a way to uh, for people to contact back to the tools team and have them have a discussion with like the new features that they need. And for more complex tools, it's actually also good to only have a few people use the tool instead of everyone. So it was better just to train one or two people to intensively use a, a tool than to teach everyone. Uh, and this way, we, it was also easier to communicate and actually focus on the features that are really the most needed. The tool itself, it's, it's not ever finished. Uh, and when it is, yeah, throw it away. <laughs> because there's probably a better tool that you could make instead. And uh, also in terms of the larger tools, uh, be careful of each frame. And uh, maybe separate the tool if it's better. OK, so uh, to communicate between uh, our tools, we have uh, two, two pathways. Uh, one way is to store data directly in the game engine uh, files and uh, fetch it back into a D. Uh, this is really useful for data that doesn't change a lot and does need versioning uh, and is very critical. <coughs> On the other side, we have our network drive. So we can quickly store files and load them from there to actually have uh, intermediate results for instance. Uh, be aware though of network lag, especially if you have a project that works uh, across multiple studios. For instance, uh, we have a studio in Montpellier that works together in Paris, but some tools just took like two minutes more to cook than in Paris just because of network lag. So you can avoid that by using mirrors and also by avoiding uh, to write incrementally. So instead of uh, writing the file live to a, a file on the network. You first want to write it locally, then copy it when it's finished, which is uh, better for the network. Okay, so here's an example of one of the cache sets that we use, uh, which is the train. So, uh, I guess it was pointer for it. No, okay, so on the top left, uh, there is uh, the, the height map, or basically the entire top row is the height map, and the row below is a flat mask which contain data like uh, where it should fade off and where the material should go, stuff like that. And we have a system to actually combine that all into which are involved. So this way we can actually keep adding new layers in the material uh, in our pipeline to uh, add more layers of detail which actually should not be feed into the layer system. <laughs> this is uh, one way we actually store our dependencies, I think. So uh, it's a way to actually make sure that data doesn't uh, re recurse, if you will. Um, so every, every layer can only affect the data that is above it and not what is below it. 
uh, and these layers during production, you can also lock them. So at some point you have to say, okay, this data is not going to change anymore because all the data on top is dependent on it. So, and of course, build some safeguards in case something changes again because that will obviously always happen. So be careful. Um, so with this kind of pipeline, it is possible to recook some of the data at lower that is that is at lower levels. Uh, but of course, you might lose some manual tweaks. So you have to inform everyone that if you are going to do something, that they will also have to do something else. So to give you a more visual representation of the <coughs> system, I have another one, which you might have seen if you've seen our GDC talk. Yeah, we are not this time. Oh wait. See the, the world is actually built up out of layers, so we have data that is affecting each other, but in such a way that it doesn't affect the data that was before it. So the villages always come after the roads, the roads always come after the base terrain, stuff like that. Okay. So that was all the stuff that was planned, but uh, during the production we actually did a lot more than we initially planned. So because we have had access to all this data, we had the option to create even more data. And sometimes you get some stuff over here. So yeah, some of the stuff uh, we actually had the chance to add almost for free, well, almost, was stuff on the left. So uh, for instance, you have the, the game map, and the minimap was actually just created completely with Udini by fetching all the data, like where the villages are, where the roads are, back into Udini and actually created. Another thing we actually managed to do was use a pathfinding algorithm over a road network and actually search where all the town names were and actually automatically create the uh, entire uh, road signs with all the village names uh, on there. Sure. I was quite happy about it. Okay, so it also went more than visual. Uh, because we cannot leave certain departments behind, uh, if you just only uh, uh, allow the art team to use uh, procedural approaches, uh, some people are left behind. So in this case, the main example is the audio team. So because every time the terrain changed, all the Udini tools were quite easily adapted, but the audio team still had to redraw all the zones uh, where the audio would go. And we thought that was problematic and also unfair. So uh, we had a, a talk with them and actually designed a system that uh, allowed them to use uh, rules that actually were outside of Houdini and use them and actually fetch where all the trees were, all the water, all the terrain, and actually generate an audio map from those rules and that data. So when did we need to stop? Uh, well, initially we thought, okay, we've got to stop about six months before the uh, end of pre-debug phase. Um, this would give us an additional six months to actually hand polish everything. Uh, although in the end we decided not to, uh, so we went all the way until the debug only stage. Uh, this way we could uh, just refresh the top layers of our data and actually help with polishing. And this again was only possible because of our layer approach. Uh, even after the, the debug only phase, uh, phase, we still helped with actually creating debug tools. Uh, such as uh, a wealth density check for triangles. So you can see that one on the right. 
it's actually uh, a heat map of how many triangles there are in the world. And this would allow us to identify possible issues with streaming uh, performance issues. And that also led into the LED multiplier. So for instance, in a dense forest, uh, the LEDs would scale down faster because you could not see as far anyway, but that would keep the performance a lot better. Other things we did was like checking for floating objects. Almost every project has to do things like that. Another thing we did like near the end was a rock cavity fix. So uh, because of the procedural replacement of a lot of rocks, we actually had to be quite careful that the player could not get stuck in between the rocks. So we had a, a system that analyzed all the concave shapes uh, in the rocks and actually placed additional rocks on top of that to make sure that the, uh, the amount of places where the bay could get stuck was, was greatly reduced. So some feedback from our users. Uh, most of them were quite happy uh, with our Nini work and our integration. But uh, of course, uh, people don't always want what they say that they want. And so people are not as informed as you would like them to be. So keep uh, talking to people and uh, keep uh, informing them and helping them understand what is possible and how difficult it is to build something. Uh, so that way you can uh, have realistic expectations from them. Also, yeah, don't build a tool when it's not necessary. And I guess most questions uh, with Houdini can always be answered with yes, but. So uh, don't say yes too many times, uh, but uh, yeah, make sure that everyone is at least comfortable with the idea of Houdini being around. Okay, so of course there were also some complaints. Uh, first one was probably the performance. Uh, this was mainly because of the integration of Houdini Engine that added like a couple of extra seconds every time. Um, eventually we got it down, so it got better. Um, but some tools took a lot of time. Some tools were actually quite interactive, uh, only took like half a second to cook, but others took 45 minutes. Uh, and eventually we decided that, yeah, above uh, 10 minutes is certainly too much for any tool that is put inside our engine. So we'll add a system uh, for the users to send the, those tasks to the render farm and then get the result back. There's also a special need for more interactive tools, which I will talk about a bit later. Um, you have to make sure that certain tools that you want to be cooking fast, you have to avoid using certain features uh, and have to balance always uh, the features that you would like and the features that you really cannot go without to make sure that your cook times are less than a second, I would say. And memory usage can also go quite high, uh, especially when fetching a lot of textures. Uh, this led to our baseline for RAM uh, being 64 gigs. Uh, on almost every PC in the entire project. Luckily, there's always room for improvement. Uh, after thinking about certain things, replacing some uh, logic with effects, uh, optimizations, uh, usually you can get, a, get results of uh, good times halving or better. And uh, of course, while you're working on the project, you also learn stuff yourself, makes uh, stuff much better. And of course, the amazing support from side effects that has new stuff to actually use for optimization as well. The other thing was UI. So the integration uh, in our engine was actually quite fine, but it did lack some of the functionality, such as handles. So there was no uh, Houdini integrated uh, way of directly interacting with tools in the viewport, if you want. Uh, so yeah, that's now on our, on our roadmap. And uh, the other note is that visual feedback is always needed, and it's especially nice if it's quick. So always add some functionality to uh, allow people to know if they're doing something wrong, and how they can improve their result. Um, and like, uh, 
I think what he also said, yeah, we're a uh, game dev, not tool dev, so make something that's useful for game developers, not for mathematicians. Uh, sometimes you just have to think about your UI and do not expose everything because it's usually not needed anyway. And it's also uh, making the tool less int intimidating. And of course, have proper documentation and have everything make sense uh, in terms of parameters, stuff like that. And uh, yeah, so if you have documentation, you can of course say, okay, please bring the documentation first and then come back to me. Of course, I will help you, but I'm also busy with something else in the meantime. So for our community, uh, in 2011, uh, there was one Houdini engine for the entirety of use of game development. Now there's over 100, if you include Houdini engine. There's strong efficient uh, support from Celepix. Uh, in Ubisoft itself, there's a growing community, and it's, it's quite nice to be in the middle of it. And uh, we have a lot of very well-trained students, and many actually are from GNHDB. So congratulations on that. <laughs> Uh, so, quick conclusion, yeah, it worked. Uh, we never really broke the build, okay, maybe once. Uh, make sure that you can keep communicating all the time. Uh, if someone, like, highly placed, suddenly thinks, okay, this Houdini thing is not working, then, yeah, you, you're out of job. So, make sure that you communicate always. If you expect something to go wrong, fix it, but also tell people about it. Uh, and, uh, yeah keep in touch with people and have them learn a bit of um, what to expect from me. And of course, uh, spend some time to look forward. It's, always, it's almost always better to uh, think about what you're going to do instead of just jumping right, right in. Because if you jump right in, you can usually create something that works in the one case that you test and then it's not scalable. So think ahead. So uh, what do we do now? Uh, we want to move to 16.5 and we 3.0, uh, well, it's already 3.0 now. Uh, go even bigger, have our five pipeline consolidate uh, and refactor our tools. So this means um, making the tools more scalable. Uh, we make it easier uh, for the tools to read from different worlds at the same time, uh, have better stability, so if, uh, yeah, it's more stable, of course. There's less edge cases, stuff like that. Uh, we want to actually move into SFX as well. Uh, it's quite an obvious direction for Houdini, but in our case, we actually didn't do a lot of SFX uh, with Houdini just yet for uh, well friends. And uh, keep exploring new solutions. Okay, uh, I'll now give a uh, presentation uh, to Pierre, who will Talk it through different set. Thank you, Thank you. Thank you. Uh, We have split the presentation in two parts, three parts mainly, so one will be coming back uh, in uh, 20 minutes, more or less. So if you've got question, uh, we will um, do everything at the end. So keep your question, and then we will do it for everyone at the end. Right. So um, now I will talk about uh, Watchdog franchise, and uh, I will explain how we use procedural stuff uh, to help the production. So procedural opportunism in Watchdog 2 world. Um, there's two names, but I'm just one guy. Uh, <laughs> Cyril Masquier uh, was uh, doing the presentation with me. Uh, he's our technical artist director uh, in Paris uh, for our watchdogs. And me, my name is Pierre Vlets. Uh, I'm working at the studio since uh, eight years now. And uh, before, I was working for the movies industry and the advertising uh, industry. Uh, so for me, Ubisoft is the first uh, video games company. Okay. Uh, Watchdog 2 World, what it is? <laughs> So uh, it was released at the end of uh, 2016. Uh, it's an open world with uh, a lot of stuff. It's uh, based on real location. It's uh, located in San Francisco Bay. So we have to have the San Francisco city, Marina, 
the other side of the Golden Gate, and then Oakland. Uh, so let's uh, jump into San Francisco a little bit. Hey, I'm Marcus. A film buff, idealist, hacker. And this, this is my home. Oh, oh. blue screen. Okay, so our context. Uh, we are working in Watchdog since uh, Watchdog 1 uh, in Paris. Uh, it's a collaboration between uh, Montreal Studio, which are the leads for Watchdog 1 and Watchdog 2. Uh, there are other studios in the world that are working on Watchdogs. So there are Newcastle, uh, Bucharest, and uh, yeah, that's okay. Uh, so because it's a collaboration, uh, we have a part of the work to do. Uh, on budget one, it was uh, only one district, it was the uh, countryside of Chicago, and uh, we have provided some uh, game modes and uh, DLC for main mission stuff. But for budget two, uh, we have a huge size to do, and uh, the resources in, uh, on the floor was the same than budget one. So basically, uh, we've got two years to deliver 40% of the work. So we have been in charge of uh, Marines and the uh, Oakland uh, area. So uh, how can we do that? Because uh, we can't have uh, many people. So uh, we thought about a way to do that by using procedural opportunism. So like uh, before, if you go to Wikipedia, and if you, <laughs> Wikipedia is good. So if you find a definition, it will be something like the severe behavior in which you use every situation to try to get an advantage. For me, it's kind of mm, negative things, right? So for us, it's uh, find opportunities to provide tools and extra tools with smarter one for delivering and challenging any production issue we got. So. Just always keeping in mind that, uh, okay, you've got this problem, mm. maybe we can find a solution with procedural things. So, why? Obviously, it's because uh, we don't have a lot of people. Uh, so the world is bigger this time, so six times. Uh, the world is more various because uh, we have different areas. We have uh, ports, uh, business areas, suburb area, with uh, a lot of countryside as well to manage. And uh, for sure, we want that the artist must focus on their real added values. So if we can generate stuff for them, and if I can build on top of that, let's do it. And for sure, we want to keep the pipeline actual. We don't want to uh, change everything uh, for everybody. So we provide some extra tools, like uh, exoskeleton tool sets, to help them uh, for being more productive. <coughs> Uh, for that, uh, we are trying to uh, establish uh, good communication with all the departments. 
So for that, we established five rules. So everybody knows what is what could be the procedural tool set. First rules, always, uh, if there's a request about a tool, or if we've got an idea, or maybe I can help you, always think about, is it needed? Sometimes it's best to go just by hand, or just ask a tool-level artist to do uh, the stuff. Always think about that the tools must be used by experts and technical artists. We don't want to deliver the tools to any artist of the floor. It's really important for us because we can keep control and uh, we can do tools much more faster. We want, we aim for 80% of accuracy. It's really important because uh, when you are creating a tool, you are thinking, okay, I will do this wonderful tool, this amazing tool, but you can't coverage 100% of the, of the task. Because uh, suddenly you have all the special cases, and these special cases will take you much more time to do than the other things. So always think about, okay, I am 80%, maybe 90 would be really nice, but don't try to do the perfect, perfect one, because you will spend uh, too much time for that. And uh, for sure, we want to have some process really fast. We don't want to wait for one night to, to have our generation. So, uh, and because we want to, uh, to add iterative on that, we want to be really fast. And uh, yeah, iterative and correctable. So it must always be editable by hand. Uh, we, don't wa we don't want want that level artist uh, stay in front of our screen and wait for minutes, minutes, minutes to have something. We want for them that it's quick. <coughs> So, what did procedural propagandism give us to us? <coughs> Among other things, the range generation, world and clip system for marine and uh, countryside of San Francisco. Uh, we provide audio tool sets as well for the audio team, uh, and the spawning entities, data analysis, VFX using the DNA. The range generation. So, uh, because uh, at Ubisoft, uh, normally we are working always uh, with, in a real location with uh, emphasis for landmark and, uh, and buildings. Uh, we want to, to have a shape that is more or less near the real life, but for sure we, it's not the same size, same dimension. Uh, the road exists. Uh, it's done by our level designers and we don't want to change them. It's really important because uh, Watch Dogs, it's uh, video games about cars, so we want to be controlled always by, uh, by, and by level artist and level designer. So we are using one machine, and uh, what we have done is basically what uh, Tvan explained before, is uh, we are working with layers. And so we have the first shape of the terrain, then we, we give it to, to the artist, then they add the level design for the roads and the uh, placement of landmarks. Then we process again into one machine to have the erosion stuff, and then we send them back, and then we take it again, and uh, it's like a layering uh, stack of process. And what we did for, for Watch of 2, it was the first time that um, we produce it for the multi seat. So we produce it for, uh, some, for uh, Montreal and for uh, Bucharest as well. So here is some uh, sneak view. Uh, so the town and for sure all the countryside with the roads and uh, everything. So <laughs> it was a generation as a services and now what we have done for rocks. Rocks is always uh, in every video game a uh, big topic. Uh, so we have uh, just tried to keep uh, as uh, lower as possible so for the memory performances. So uh, we have tried to work with uh, 3D object bounds with a limited number of assets. And uh, by using a procedural real-time shader, noise placement of the works, we can blend them together. Uh, the, obviously, the, the main goal is to have a low cost, the lowest cost on GPU. And uh, it's freedom for artists as well because they can uh, blend it together and it's ready for procedural spawning. So here is just a, a video which will explain to you 
<coughs> quite works. So I've got just a rock. So there's a shader on it uh, for um, uh, darker so area uh, near the water. There's another rock, the same rock in fact, but if you blend them together because of the color noise uh, placement, you, you've got another one uh, just uh, twice bigger. So it was working really well and it helped us to, to scatter and to make some placement for the rocks. So here we have in the part of Houdini. Uh, you have to know that Houdini is not the only tool that are used for procedure. You can use code, you can ask engineers, you can uh, use some of our software. But uh, for us and for me it was the easiest tool to do uh, in the time that we got. So the first thing before using Houdini is always the same, is Houdini the best solution. For sure, we can use uh, here so, so the icons of our engine, it's the suit. Uh, it's an in-house uh, 3D uh, game engine. Uh, we've got Python as well, you can use it. Yeah, for sure, or C Sharp or C++. Uh, feature tool, like uh, I don't know yet, but uh, it could be awesome. And uh, we've got Houdini. And for sure, Houdini must transfer always the same five golden rules that we got. Is it needed? Only for experts, 80% of accuracy it must be fast and iterative. So, yeah, first example, Scatterbox. Uh, when I start Project 2, uh, it was my first task. <laughs> so, uh, after that, we've got some vegetation system generation, work polish pass, lighting supports, or QMAP placement because on uh, WatchDog 2 uh, the reflection was done with uh, QMAPs along all the low networks and uh, I use Odini for that so it saved month and month of uh, hand placements and uh, because I can change the rules very easily I can change the amount of QMAPs and uh, size so it was very neat for the production and uh, I use it also for audio teams to help them and uh, work data analysis for sure. And yeah, at the end, VFX, because I'm a VFX artist as well. Okay, so uh, <laughs> we've got some more than six kilometers square to be achieved. And uh, we don't want to uh, say to the level artist, okay, okay guys, go on and just put some rocks and you've got uh, three weeks to do that. So uh, it's based on terrain data and placement rules, slopes, curvature, uh, proximity, and uh, we do some rock decision. So here's some uh, just uh, screenshots of what we got. So we take the terrain, we add big rocks. So here's just terrain, big rocks on top of that. So then we can ask uh, the level artist, hey, is it okay or do you want to break the shape by hand? Mm -hmm. Yeah, for sure I can. And then we take the result back, we do some uh, heat map composition for the terrain, and then we add all of the smoke, uh, no, the smoke, <laughs> the small details, uh, like uh, small rocks and uh, vegetation on top of it. So here's another view, with big rocks, and uh, well, you have to look it pretty closely, but uh, trust me, there's some small rock on top of it. <laughs> so, uh, after that, what we did is vegetation computation. Uh, the full world must be uh, fully consistent, so we must have any grass everywhere, we must have trees, bushes, flowers. Uh, it's always based on biome repartition and it's defined by custom rules, by uh, world machine inputs and by uh, director art uh, placement. Always must be an iterative process. Uh, we want to be easily modified by hand if we don't want a bush here or a tree there. So here's just a screenshot to explain. I've got just a vegetation placed by hand for the moment, and then uh, we scatter biome repartition uh, with grass, flowers, and, uh, and trees. So here's what it works by layer. So we've got an area with uh, trees placed by hand. We've got this map uh, sent to our art director 
and uh, he grew on top of it to say, okay, this area I want some redwoods, this area I want a canthus or everything. Then uh, we use OTD to uh, instantiate a different area with a different biome, layer by layer. So from priority one, priority two, priority three, and priority four. And then what next? Because we know all the raw data, we can uh, avoid and exclude everything where uh, we don't want to have vegetation. And on top of that, which is nice, uh, artists can do some manual exclusion. So if we have to regenerate everything, we do it, but we can keep the manual exclusion. So we keep the uh, level artist work, which is really nice for, for you, everyone. And we obtain this. So, uh, Udini, for me, it's a very nice tool because you can work on the different stages of the production. So, you can work directly at the first beginning with terrain, with uh, spawning some uh, vegetation, spawning some rocks, and then you can provide tools at the different step of your production, which is very nice. And for the whole Polish pass, uh, we have tried to help the artist to add details into the world. So, here, just uh, a business area of Oakland and uh, how to add details on this kind of picture. We, we can add them to add details by uh, spawning decals. So decals, what are they? It's graffiti, tracks, dirt, dead leaves, and everything is populated by this system. We can use area qualification, so we won't have the same graffiti if we are in a business area than in a suburb area or in, in the port. Uh, we have different uh, density of tracks depending on the qualification of the district. Uh, we can drive a lot of rules with that. So, okay, we've got graffiti, but hmm, what next? Uh, we will add also vegetation on a non terrain area. So, we have to find all the places where the primitive have got some grass material and we can spawn some. Uh, some, some uh, grass subject on it, and uh, which is nice with the tool, is also we can avoid overlaps, because uh, transplant overlaps for video games is nightmare. So for free, we have a tool that spawns directly everything, and then we can control the, the um, objects uh, which are inside uh, over one. And my next, the so next part, it's uh, ground occlusion. So we apply on static objects uh, on the terrain a darker area. So for free, we obtain this, which is quite nice. And then we can uh, use everywhere uh, to help artists. So here is another topic, audio. And uh, when I was starting uh, with uh, the guys in Watch of Two in Paris, uh, we were just two guys who was working with Udini. And uh, Mathieu, uh, our audio designer, start to, to look at uh, what uh, Tran and uh, his team are doing and uh, what I'm doing with Udini. And said to me, hey, maybe I can use it for my task. Because I've got so much repetitive tasks to do, and uh, it's always depending on the world. If I can uh, just provide some data every week, it could be great. So, I help him to avoid repetitive audio tasks. So I just spent three weeks with him just to explain how Houdini works with the notes, with uh, Python and uh, extra. And because he has got some skills in programming, he can do a lot of things with Python. So he, he take Houdini and in one month, he provides some great tools so it's always based on custom rules and world daily data. Uh, so here is some tool set for, for, for him. Water paint. So he provides uh, each, each week a uh, new uh, water paint, wind paint, rain paint, and uh, a lot of things. So uh, this, this, uh, this slide is just to illustrate that uh, because it's always based on uh, World, world daily data, you can have at the beginning of your production all, all this data for free and update it every week or every two weeks, it depends. 
so yeah, world of this because uh, we are working in uh, video games and video games are going bigger and bigger. We have to analyze all the data that we've got into our games. So by uh, using Udini, we can help TV and help our TV decision and daily days, daily uh, data of the world. So let's say, for example, hmm, why I have got this object into the sky? Oh, why I've got 200 objects uh, on the origin of the world? So with Udini, we can scan it very quickly and uh, we can provide some reports to them. The goal is not always to fix the issue, because issue, uh, you, you need some human deci decision for that. It's very really important. So, a kind of tool that we provide is occludability. So, this one is kind of a mystery, but I will explain it. Uh, every green area, it's where you can occlude easily the distance the uh, player view. So in this area, we know that if we have to do some mission, some uh, uh, second activity, we can do it uh, for free because uh, we can include very really quickly. And in the red and orange area, we know that it could be challenging. So uh, it's a good way to uh, give to the level designer, level artist, oh wait, be, be careful with that because uh, you will see really far. And uh, we can uh, update this data every week or every day. Uh, uh, we have provided also a vegetation check, so to avoid too many overlaps to the objects. So we scan every vegetation in the world, and we know exactly where there's a lot of overlaps, or where there's a lack of uh, vegetation, and uh, we can uh, fix it. And we have also reports a lot of uh, objects, depending of urban city, or, or so, conscious spawning, uh, it's one of my favorite slides, so uh, stay focused. Okay, so uh, we are playing, because we are playing every day to our games, with uh, our engine, and uh, by recording performance. Using Python and Houdini, we can provide some things like I like to call question spawning. What is it? Uh, one of my types was to bring life to a consistent world, and uh, we have to control entity instantiation. So here is an example. We've got Oakland, uh, a part of Oakland, and I have to spawn birds, two types of birds, pigeons and seagulls. What I know about pigeons, there's a receipt. These <laughs> pigeons like food. Okay, so where I have to find places where I, I have to, to find food? Okay, maybe by using uh, data analysis, I can get parcel location, terraces, parking, and I can say, okay, this place is, is for food. I've got another receipt for seagulls. It's almost the same because uh, they are birds. And uh, the specialty is, uh, okay, seagulls, they are necessities, and uh, I want to have a density less than uh, three seagulls by uh, square meters. So here's just a, a first uh, spoon. So I've got yellow points and a uh, couple points for seagulls. And because we are recording memory performances and the GPU performance, we can, we can say, okay, uh, let me, okay. We can know that there's some red area where we know that the performances will be uh, uh, quite uh, tedious. So we can say, okay, we can uh, save it from the spawning and then we keep only the spawning to the blue uh, area. So here is the detection, and then the result. So we spawn, we have the ability to spawn some uh, objects, some ear objects or any objects, uh, regarding the performance. So we, we, can, we are sure that this spawning won't hurt the performance. So for us, it's a really good way to control things. And for sure, for me, for us, it's a feature. So, uh, conclusion to my uh, presentation. First, and uh, this one is very important, education is the key. Education into your team, uh, between uh, you as procedural artist and the other guy, uh, between you and uh, the producer, between you and the technical artist. It's very important. 
And to explain, like Twan said, that uh, Udili is not doing everything, procedural is not doing everything, but it's a part of it. And uh, you can build on top of it. Uh, the team must be involved in the process, so you have always to uh, impact, to, to say to, to them, okay, tell me what you need, uh, don't give me your feedbacks. Okay, I can, maybe I can improve it. Or, yeah, yeah you've got a good idea, who can do that? It's really important to keep um, every person uh, as a team. Organization is more than monetary. I didn't say that before, but documented everything you are doing. If you are waiting the end of the position to do documentation for your tool, your tool will never be used. So documentation is like the first thing you do. You do your documentation, then you are doing your tool. And it will help you for creating your tools. And keep things a really simple. It's really important and break things into small parts. So for us, uh, for sure, opportunism was a safe path, path to procedural. And uh, I do believe that we will uh, do it uh, more and more. Thank you.
the, the, size, the, the size of the gate. And some wall sets, instead of having just a hole in the wall, you can use a, a portal uh, instance, which will be automatically placed as well. So you can go again through different wall types, through some of them. So as, as you can maybe see that some of the wall tools are, uh, wall sets are horizontal, and some actually follow the terrain. So we can actually also include that into the, the base rules of the, the tool. And just to demonstrate like how it is um, aware of the terrain, if I move this point on top of the road, it automatically places a gate. Because the system is aware that there is a road, and it probably shouldn't place a wall on top of the road. So we'll try to adapt. OK, so, oh, okay. there you go. So how does this compare to manual placement? Uh, of course, there are some downsides. We we'll have to give up some amount of control. And to actually make these tools work, you have to have a lot of communication between the art team and the tech team to make sure that all the models have the right sizes, the pivots are placed in the right place, the orientation of the objects are correct, stuff like that. And uh, of course, it requires a small initial time investment before you start to see some results. But it's almost always working. Um, the upsides are that you uh, can have more variation with the same art. Because if you have a wall and a wall segment and you split it smartly in uh, multiple parts, you can reuse these uh, modules in a more varying uh, way. It cuts out the repetitive work. You can have more consistency because uh, you can actually build in rules in the tool to actually enforce some metrics. So uh, your designers and your programmers uh, can give you certain rules that certain walls should not become higher than a certain amount just so it works with the plane navigation, stuff like that. And that way you can prevent user errors. So have it adjust to the environment, like in the video. Uh, so parts can have game logic. So because there are small parts, you can actually put logic on the parts. So if you want to drive through a wall, it's easier if the wall pieces are destructible instead of the entire wall. Because then you have to, it's on top of the wall, also create a unique uh, destruction uh, effect as well. And finally, you can uh, afford to create smaller tiles. Because uh, if you have to place the wall by hand, it's convenient if the pieces are big, because then you have to place less pieces. But if the placement doesn't actually cost you any time, you can have much smaller pieces, which allows you to have uh, more control. And you can uh, have not too much, uh, you have more flexibility in how you use it in a Houdini tool. And as a score bonus, you have less uh, mesh compression artifacts. So because the meshes are smaller, they're closer to the pivot of the object, you can compress uh, the meshes a bit better. Okay, so here's another example. <coughs> in this case, uh, a bridge generation tool. Like initially, it will follow mostly the same logic. So you place a curve uh, across the, uh, the bridge. And because uh, yeah, we built this tool uh, with user interaction in mind, we wanted to be able to quick, uh, cook it quick. Of course, it sped up a bit uh, because of like, how much thinking uh, I was doing. Uh, you can see also that there was a pre-selection menu in uh, for what kind of bridge. And it, it was uh, using a border only, and now it's using it one width of order, you can specify the width, which will automatically adjust the pieces in the middle of the bridge, because it will try to figure out which piece is the closest to the piece that I would want. So I'm just going through some of the types of bridges that we made. And some of these actually use uh, the same pieces together with other pieces. So you can actually, if you have multiple pieces, you can create even more variation. So uh, if you have to choose one, with a sidewalk, uh, we can do some more tweaking to make sure that the ends line up nicely. And it's actually <coughs> an advantage because you can tweak both sides of the river individually. You don't have to go to the middle of the bridge and then 
Red data is the only finely fit, which you can just create a unique bridge for all the spring. Um, so just to give you an idea of how many instances these actually are. So these are all individual pieces. And that way you can actually have uh, actually a bridge that follows a curve quite nicely. So if we actually make the curve a lot more complicated, the bridge will still adapt just fine. And that is because we uh, made small tasks. And that way the angle between the pieces becomes smaller, so you have a continuous result still. Okay, so now let's go a bit more crazy. I just added this for the demo. Uh, so on top of that, we could also add a curve to adjust <laughs> where the bridge goes up, so you can create uh, a nice skate ramp, for instance. <laughs> but yeah, it's a bit too crazy. So um, by default, we'll follow a a nerve curve in terms of the, the smoothing, but if you want to specifically stretch bridge, you can do that too. And here you can actually see that the parts are stretched because uh, this bridge type only had uh, one width specified at the moment, but if you put it back at the right size, it actually looks quite nice. And it's one of my favorite bridges, I think, or like bridge types at least. Uh, okay, so how do we compare it to procedural modeling? So again, there are some downsides. You don't have like literal infinite variation because you actually want to avoid creating uh, many unique meshes. Uh, that's what this thing is for. But repetition can become noticeable. So if you don't have enough part variation uh, and you don't really use uh, smart flipping or rotation of uh, of your parts, you can see repetition eventually. Uh, and you need to prevent gaps between the pieces. So you can do this by having smaller pieces, so the angle between the parts becomes smaller, or you can use uh, some procedural modeling to actually have a simple mesh that fills the gap, or you can have special uh, particle systems. The upsides are better performance because it uses instancing, so in general, that's better for the GPU, the RAM, and it requires less space because you don't store unique meshes. You have more uh, control over the visual direction, especially on small scale, <coughs> because if you have to talk with your uh, visual art director and he says, yeah, can you tweak this thing? And then you tweak it and then everything changes. But if you can go to uh, like a props artist, you can say, can you tweak this module? It's a lot of uh, So that allows us also to split the work between the tools and art. So we can focus on our best skills, and uh, for sort of, for example, uh, right now it's still a bit easier for artists to create UVs if you want to use uh, a pre-generated picture, for instance. And you, since you only have to do it once anyway, because it's embedded in the instance and not in the tool, you can do it that way. And because you're working with point clouds uh, instead of meshes, uh, the generation times are also. So uh, that's that said, uh, we're still using procedural modeling. So some examples we use it for are uh, performing stamp meshes, uh, the water meshes, uh, first value tools, debug tools, uh, to render our textures, and uh, for building shells, which I'll show you now. So this actually is uh, a tool that kind of demonstrates the uh, advantage of using metrics. Like it's a very uh, bare bones tool uh, right now, it'll be how it looks. Uh, but you can quickly specify the, uh, the size of the building that you would like, and it will automatically adjust the values if the user puts something in that the designers did not uh, and account for. So the buildings always have the right sizes. You can easily add uh, an additional floor, and you can start adding uh, doors and windows. And the advantage of doing it this way is that the doors uh, are always placed the right uh, distance away from the corners of the buildings, and the windows always have the right height above the floors. So it works with your game cover mechanics, stuff like that. And 
after some tweaking, you can just copy the result from the bottom part of the top part, and then uh, tweak it again. Um, okay, so other things you could do are adding uh, a hole in the floor, for instance. So you can stick it in. There we go. Put a stair module uh, that goes between floors that has the right size uh, predefined. You can adjust the roof, put it back. And as you might have seen on the edge, of the, the corners, there's a, some decals there, which are also uh, generated by the group in this case. So they uh, are not needed by the, to do anymore by the uh, artist. And when you finally dress it up, when you add the proper windows, add the edge details, and replace the roof with like the final version, uh, the mesh actually becomes quite nice, and it still follows all the uh, aforementioned rules. So, uh, I would like to thank you a lot. Uh, thanks to the team, thanks to the amazing tool team in Paris and in Montpellier. I would like to also yeah, invite you back on stage. Mm -hmm. And uh, we're really happy to answer some of your questions. to uh, let us know if we find some kind of hack or we'll uh, do it in a way that is safe enough. But yeah, uh, that is how we experience it. And cert uh, certain things we can do is uh, just disable the ability to launch certain jobs to the render farm, stuff like that. Uh, yeah, who manages your tool production? Is that a lead or is there a specific? Uh, uh, well, just me, we just uh, we have a, we have a core team that actually asks us uh, like what types of tools uh, to to build. Uh, we have we have lead of course. Um, that's better one. Uh, you might have seen him on uh, DDC talk as well. Um, so yeah, we have to constantly decide what priorities are, uh, what's the best stuff to build, and who should build it. Uh, but it's a bit of an organic process. We just communicate and try to figure out what the needs are and what we can do. Uh, yeah. How much of the mission setup is procedural for so for the, for the gameplay, for the designers, for the encounters? I, is that placed randomly or, well, so not randomly, procedurally? Yeah. Um, or, or, or is Control. that much more manually? Uh, most of it is manual. Um, there are cer certain types of events that are procedurally placed. Um, uh, this actually is one, I think I presented that two years ago as well. So uh, based on the roads and uh, including uh, all the uh, collision objects, we have a system that scans all the free space that can actually uh, spawn some random events if the environment allows it. Uh, but most of the uh, like emission content is all empty. Can you explain a little bit more about Okay, um, so yeah, uh, what we do, for instance, is uh, in also the layer and layer process, for instance, uh, we first build the base terrain using one machine. Uh, after that, you add just vegetation for the entire world, not taking into account missions, anything. And after that, you start to draw exclusion curves, uh, texture maps that can occlude uh, certain things. And then you start to work in the occluded uh, areas, either with procedural tools or or with hand tested. So that's how that works. Um, yeah, you showed lots of tools with uh, CSV files. So yeah, did you see that? Uh, <laughs> and, uh, who uh, creates those CSV files? Okay, yeah. Uh, so that's usually would be the person who built the tool, I think. Uh, but uh, I will explain to them, for instance, uh, like. If, they, if I think it's useful for them to be able to change it, I'll explain how it works. And 
and sometimes it's easier for me to train someone uh, to take care of that so I can focus on other things. To what extent is everything pre-baked or, or cooked, or do you still do some stuff in real time to save memory and this usage? Okay, uh, so Houdini Engine is not capable of real-time generation in Engine yet, uh, so everything is baked. Uh, yeah, we, we still have our um, and, uh, GPP uh, gameplay programmer team that still has some uh, real-time generation but it sometimes sources from pre-baked data, and sometimes uh, they just do it themselves. Actually, from that, uh, yes, that machine is doing the wetness and knots, for example. Do you do, do uh, <coughs> the formation of the rest as well? Uh, no, no deformation. Uh, we can add it with vertex shader, uh, for sure. But for needs, uh, it, it doesn't be uh, necessary. So uh, we only keep uh, color and normal uh, as well. So that's it. But uh, yeah, it's a good point. Maybe for the future. <laughs> uh, how did you affect for uh, uh, weather and uh, other effects that could happen uh, dynamically in the game? Okay. Um, uh, is it for both, I think? Yeah, because yeah. it's different. Uh, yeah, for watch uh the weather is um, directly into the engine. So it's uh, based on time of day. So uh, we've got some uh, weather presets and uh, it changes uh, depending on the condition. But uh, everything, is, uh, it's everything is handled by an uh, engineer. Yeah. Uh, in our case, uh, it's in the boat. So uh, we have uh, some changers that are, uh, can be dependent on the current weather. So for instance, the, the dirt will become wet when it's ready. But there's also some baked uh, wetness, uh, like near the, the river uh, rivers, the general ground is a bit more dark based on that. And uh, for instance, if there's instances of uh, a tap or a hose uh, placed somewhere in the world, the Houdini can actually read that and stamp a bit of uh, a puddle around it as well. In that final example, So it's a bit of a cleaning step. Uh, UVs are generated by the system. Uh, it's, it's just uh, cutting the mesh in a way that is required by the, the LD team because the rules uh, for them also change a bit. And sometimes the tool is not like as far in development as the other thing. Uh, but in general, we try to uh, put it on the engine, get it into 3ds Max and then do some cleaning process, but it should be quite limited. Yeah, how, um, what's the size of the Houdini tools here? Uh, okay, so uh, for Paris, uh, that would be a bit more. Yim, Erwin, and me. And yeah, that's mostly it for, for what that's so far. I use Cosy the Studio as well. Uh, so yeah, right now the tools team for <laughs> Wildlands is in Paris and Montpellier. And yes, th th that would be. Uh, the, the amount of users of the Houdini engine are also known as the Yeah, sorry. Um, at the beginning of the talk, you said that you concentrated more on having smaller, smaller tool sets rather than big, all encompassing tools. Yeah. Is there a, have you got a good example as to one of those all encompassing tools that was better split out into smaller pieces? Uh, yeah, I, I, yeah. Okay. Okay. Uh, yeah, I've got a good one. It's the scatter stuff that uh, we have done for Wajo 2. At the beginning, uh, I've got a tool, and uh, when uh, the other Houdini artist arrives in the project, Bertrand, I show him the tool, and he says, well, a lot of parameters. He said to him, yes, but that's cool, you can control everything. And uh, after that, he starts to explain to me, oh, maybe you can split it in uh, several parts, like maybe for the scatter stuff, first, do a tool for analyzing uh, terrain stuff like slopes, curvature, occlusion, whatever. Then uh, do a tool for just scattering things and then do another tool to uh, take proximity and uh, analysis proximity. So by splitting things, I've got three tools. One for analyzing the terrain, 
one for scattering object or having some nice placement rules and the other one for avoiding to have object overlapping each other and that kind of things. So it's exactly the same uh, things for everyone. The best thing to do, in fact, I think, is to write just with some few sentences what your tool, what are the purpose of your tools, and each sentence, each line of your code must be a tool. For me, it's um, kind of uh, nice rules. Yeah, I, of course, there is a balance because at some point, after you build like 200 OGLs, it becomes also a bit of a strain on the, the versioning system. So there's somewhere like a right way in the middle somewhere. Uh, how do you start the procedural workflow breaking things like game design? <coughs> game design? OK, yeah, yeah. So there's a lot of uh, debug. Um, we, we have some masks that automatically exclude stuff where it definitely should not be. So we have, uh, for instance, good data on where the roads are, so we can automatically make sure that nothing is placed directly on top of the roads. Um, we have some data uh, about like where the uh, manual placement for camps and stuff is. If the data is correctly filled out by LDs, we can fetch it. Sometimes stuff will break because some data is missing and the system is not aware of it. In that case, there's two things we can do, which is either uh, fix the, the input of the data so the system catches it, or we can add a manual exclusion zone, uh, so the result is excluded in the area. Yeah, when you're talking about the, the pigeons and the seagulls, uh, yeah. you mentioned so that you exclude uh, don't spawn in areas with uh, 5 GPU usage. Yeah. And by the way, I just want to find the term uh, profile guided ornithology. Uh, my question is, uh, do you use this technique uh, for, for spawning anything else, like uh, small props uh, and seagulls as well? On Wajo 2, uh, we didn't have the time to do that because uh, the pigeons and the uh, okay, bird stuff uh, have done it really at the Polish pass. And uh, then uh, we don't have any time, but we can use it for everything, like uh, Living City, for example, uh, like uh, uh, VFX spawning as well. I've used it a little bit because uh, I wanted to populate, to bring life everywhere, in fact to have something in movement everywhere. So I use it for the wildlife a little bit, but uh, the wildlife in Watcher 2 is a very small one, so uh, there's just uh, eagles and uh, kind of things like that, but uh, that's all. But uh, I, I, I'm quite sure that uh, you can use it for something else. process so making sure that we because uh, yeah like for wildlands a lot of paths were hard coded in the tools stuff like that so we build a system to actually uh, make the the path to network drive automatically adapt to which world it would work on stuff like that uh, and it, yeah it's a cleaning process it's an optimization process uh, luckily we had some time to actually uh, do that properly and it's still an ongoing process, but... Uh, yeah. For me, it's the same, in fact. Uh, at the end of Project 2, uh, I have uh, plenty of tools. Even some are was really old, and uh, I am redoing everything to have something very clear and uh, well documented. It's very, very important. <laughs> Even if it's kind of boring. <laughs> You mentioned at the start of your talk that you wanted to stop tools six months before the end of debug, but it went on to the end of debug. Yeah. Can you just talk us through what those scales were? Like how many months were you in concept debug and then in full production? Uh, I don't think I'm technically allowed to disclose the exact timelines. <laughs> uh, but yeah, so um, I think, yeah. So say, like a, about like a year. Before release, we started to lock down stuff quite, quite a lot. Uh, not entirely, but, but yeah, uh, you know, we started locking the roads. Uh, like was on the slide, uh, one and a half year before ship. So yeah, that's it's a gradual process, but eventually more stuff gets locked, and we have to communicate it. That's how it and uh, in video games, there's always uh, stages. So you've got uh, just uh, FP, fast playable version of your game, 
then you go to the pre-alpha, alpha, beta, and uh, gold. Uh, it's like uh, when uh, people has ask for locked uh, layers or data, it's really in the process of doing video games, so people are used to. So we've got milestones, and uh, at each milestone, we've got some feature that are locked, and then we, we will move on. What I found interesting was when you talked about other departments becoming kind of jealous of what you were doing with procedural generation. Uh, if I understood it correctly, mm -hmm. do you think Houdini can be also applied to uh, their uses, or have you come across things that can't be done well? Um. I, I don't know if I understand your question completely correctly. Um, the art team didn't become jealous, I think, but um, like we just thought like certain teams would would be could fall behind if we didn't include them. That's sort of how the process worked. Um, of course, um, yeah. Like so sometimes uh, artists were like, "Oh yeah, if you told me there was a tool for that, that would be." Good. And sometimes, uh, like, they don't think of asking you, and then you have to be sure that they know that the option is there. Thank you, everyone. Yeah. Thanks a lot.